Checkity check, ch sound check. Are we ready? Okay, cool. Thank you guys. Good evening. My name is Eric, and I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about uh, sort of what I would tell my 20 year old self, apparently, is what uh, Professor Littman asked me to talk about. I got a few more remarks than that for you, uh, and I think if I'd known all this stuff back then, I would have made a lot fewer mistakes. Uh, but I hope that uh, you guys will feel free to jump in, intervene, interrupt me uh, as, you, uh, as you need to. If there's anything I say up here that isn't clear, uh, sometimes I suffer from the curse of knowledge a little bit and I get a little abstract and I'm going to need you guys to slow me down and um, have, have me explain that stuff to you. Uh, but uh, this is one of my favorite sayings from Vince Lombardi. Uh, we, didn't run, we didn't lose the game, we just ran out of time. That, that has a lot to do with how uh, the modern business world uh, works today. And I'm going to try and prove that to you in the stuff that I'm going to show you here uh, over the course of the next hour or so. Um, this is a photograph from the Vietnam conflict. Uh, and this illustrates one of the keys to this uh, point. And that is that most people in business are playing a finite game. They play a game that has a winner and a loser, and it has an ending to it. And uh, business is not finite. Business is an infinite game. There's a book that just came out a few months ago from a, a philosopher named Simon Sinek, uh, and it's called The Infinite Mindset. And read it, because it really will help you to adjust your mindset and your uh, perspective to what I think is the definition of leadership in the 21st century. And we're going to dig into some of that uh, a little bit. But why did the US lose the Vietnam conflict? We lost because we were trying to win. And the Vietnamese were playing to keep playing. That's a big, big part of this attitude adjustment that I hope you guys will go home with tonight when we're all said and done is don't play to win, play to keep playing. And I'll tell you a little bit about my story and how that kind of played out in my own career uh, a few years ago. Uh, but keep that in the back of your mind as you're, as you're thinking about this. What is my infinite game uh, versus what is my definition of winning? To win something means the game comes to an end. And your life is not a, a finite game. You are living an infinite game yourself. So uh, be thinking about that as we go through this. Um, we are in the 132nd consecutive month of economic expansion in the United States. And reversion to the mean can be a real big disappointment. We are long overdue for a uh, contraction. Uh, and I've, I've spent about 25 years going through four of these. Uh, two of them technically were recessions by, by definition, but there were two other flattenings uh, of the yield curve that led to an economic environment that was, uh, ironically, countercyclical uh, for us. When the economy sucks, my business does great. And I'll tell you what my business is in a second uh, as we get to this. But as you can see, uh, we're overdue for a correction. Uh, for those of you graduating in the next couple of years, um, buckle up, because this economy is about to get pretty interesting. And a lot of the definitions of how competition and uh, growth are going to be defined going forward are going to change. So I hope to give you some insight into that sort of stuff. Um, this concept of growth champion is an important one from the context of what it is I do. I work in a field known as competitive intelligence. Have you ever heard of competitive intelligence, anybody? Probably not. Um, it's sort of the uh, below the radar practice of analyzing the future. And so a lot of what people in my line of work do is we hypothesize about what might happen next, and then we look for indicators and warnings of those events emerging in the marketplace. And so a lot of uh, what clients hire my company to do for them is to predict the pathways that will get them to the most optimal and probable future, and then to help them figure out what to do about it. Uh, there's a system that we've developed called superiority analysis that I'll kind of take you through a little bit. Uh, but the fundamental question is growth, how to grow. Uh, and that fundamental question begs another question, which is where to invest. That's essentially what I do. For a, for a living. What my firm does for a living is we predict where to invest in order to produce predictable and even programmable growth. Um, in order for this predictive intelligence capacity to have any sort of a yield, 
you have to have three characteristics in the clients that you work with. There must be humility, there must be empathy, and there must be teachability. In the absence of those three criteria, I can't help you if you're my client. Um, and as you might imagine, in the Fortune 1000 corporate world, there's a lot of very unhumble, unempathetic, and unteachable people who are willfully helpless. I can't help them and until they come to this uh, position in life. And uh, as C.S. Lewis liked to say, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. It's putting other people's interests ahead of your own. Um, and that's one reason why I'm really interested in Concordia. I visited your campus for the first time last November uh, with a buddy of mine uh, and his wife, Jeff and Amy Meyer. They're going to be back here actually on Friday doing a program a couple floors up from here called the Dream Accelerator. Jeff's a Lutheran pastor. He wrote a book last year uh, called The uh, Fear Not, Dream Big, and Execute. Uh, Jeff's meant a lot to me. He's actually helped me in my own ministry to figure out how to thread uh, my company and my ministry together. And I'll touch on that a little bit here tonight. Uh, if you want to know more about that, feel free to ask. Uh, but uh, the ability to think of others' interests ahead of your own is prerequisite in order for the work that I do to have any yield at all. And so the context of that in corporate America is, pretty, is a pretty tough one, a uh, pretty tough one to, uh, to push. But those values are very central uh, to what it is I'm going to be talking to you about. Um, truth is really a matter of perspective. You've all got a little piece of the truth, but the truth is one thing. The truth is reality. And how you see that truth allows you to understand uh, your reality in a slightly different way than the person sitting next to you right now. When you look at that same truth from different perspectives, you have a more accurate depiction of what reality actually is. Uh, but it's still just the same thing. So a lot of what I do in this world known as competitive intelligence is I synthesize the perspectives of, of a lot of knowledgeable people in order to more accurately describe what the reality is that is confronting everybody. And even when you think you understand what that truth is, in other words, um, truth is the cylinder, and you can make true statements like a blue shadow is cast from the top side and a rectangular shadow is cast from the left, you might not even have the whole picture there from those two perspectives. A third perspective may exist that says you're actually looking at a wedge, not a, not a cylinder. And from that perspective, you see a triangle uh, coming from a different point of view. So a lot of what intelligence does is to synthesize these perspectives and to continue to synthesize those perspectives until we have an accurate picture of what's really going on. Once you have an accurate picture of real, what's really going on, you can begin to program an organization's growth strategy. This is my 20-year-old self. Um, and below it, you see my Slack description, uh, and that's really my highest calling. Uh, my job is to cast vision for the companies that are in my portfolio and then uh, energize my people to achieve that vision and clear the way. That's it. I don't actually have any specific job description anymore for the companies that I own uh, and that I started and that I'm in charge of. My job is to cast vision for them and then clear the way so they can do it. That's really how I define leadership. And so uh, you'll notice the super uh, clever Science Olympiad um, t-shirt in the, in the photo there. This is me home for probably Thanksgiving break, probably my sophomore year at Madison, uh, where I did my undergrad. So the point of this is that there are, uh, there's this thing known as superiority. And superiority is this programmable aspect of what businesses can do to achieve success. It's very, very predictable. And as I've sort of built on this theory and now tested it with uh, eh, about four dozen enterprises over the last few years, um, it's really worked out the kinks of how superiority gets done. My entire business strategy is based upon executing on the superiority mission. So how do you actually make an organization achieve superiority in a marketplace and then predict how competitors will attempt to assail that superior strategy. That's what we're going to talk about for a good portion of tonight. It's based on determining the superiority criteria. I think my laser pointer just quit. Superiority criteria, 
of which there's three kinds, and we'll go through what those are. And then uh, exerting force on your control factors. That's all there is to it. If you understand what the superiority criteria of the market is, that the market will reward with share, and you have a full inventory of your control factors, you can produce any outcome in a business competitive situation. So, um, however, very seldom do plans survive their encounter with the market. Mike Tyson has this phrase, I think it's on that slide. Mike Tyson has this phrase that uh, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And once you get punched in the mouth, your plan's out the window. You gotta figure out what to do now. That's a big, big part of what competitive intelligence is there for. And so figuring out how to do that involved looking at losers. Uh, I'm a history undergrad. I'm fascinated by uh, all sorts of different kinds of history. And over the years, I've studied lots of different time periods and geographies and cultures. And um, I'm asked often, what is it that they all have in common? And I struggled with that question for years. And in the last couple of years, I realized that it, the common thread in all of it was losers. I'm super, super turned on by and curious about what precursor events led to a defeat, whether that's a political defeat, an assassination, a, a you know, military conflict, a cultural uh, sort of um, decadence, all of the stuff that goes on uh, throughout the historical record. It's all about losers and how to figure out what they did that led to that eventual loss. At what point did the loss go from mere possibility to inevitability. Turns out you can do the same thing in the business world. Actually, this, by the way, is um, Waterloo, where uh, Napoleon was very, very improbably defeated by the British. Um, and it's a very mythical story within the intelligence world because there's a guy named Nathan Rothschild who was a banker in London who took over the Bank of England because of the outcome of this battle. Nathan Rothschild had spies that were uh, looking at the battlefield and sending messages back to uh, his communications network in London describing how the battle was going. Everybody assumed that Napoleon was going to win this battle. And so uh, the Bank of England had priced that into the London Stock Exchange. Nathan Rothschild took a position where he, he noticed that the British were winning, and then he did a very, very counterintuitive thing. He liquidated all of his assets on the London Stock Exchange. He sold off everything and went to, a, went to a cash position on all of it. That sent a message to the rest of the investment community that the defeat was worse than they expected, that England was really getting creamed at Waterloo, when of course and the opposite was true. Once the stock exchange was devalued to about 12% of its original position, Rothschild came in with all that cash and bought it all up. And today, the Rothschild family controls most of European banking uh, as a result a couple hundred years later. So this describes the asymmetry of intelligence that organizations want to create. That's basically what we do. We create asymmetries in the accurate understanding of reality. Simple as that. Now, let me pause for questions and see if you guys have questions about this because I've used a lot of really abstract terms. I want to make sure you guys are tracking. It's not all that early in the day. Um, and I want to make sure you guys have an opportunity to stop me and get a little more concrete explanation if you need it. Questions? All right. Uh, so this is what strategy looks like to most organizations. And where you fit in the process of formulating a strategy is a very, very abstract idea. Um, no one in my client uh, roster can really look at this and say, boy, I know, I know definitively where I sit in the organization, what my strategic responsibilities are. They can't, because it's too complicated. What strategy really is, is the expression of a corporation's culture to the marketplace. Peter Drucker uh, invented modern management. And his famous saying, a culture eats strategy for breakfast, uh, is more true now than it ever was before. If the culture of your organization cannot execute its chosen strategy, you will fail. And in fact, we use that as a weapon in the marketplace. Whenever I look at an analysis of a company, I begin with the company's strategy. Can the company actually execute on the strategy that it has, given the culture that it has? 
It's the most frail part of a company's uh, profile in the market is what their culture looks like and the recalibration of that culture to what the market opportunity really is. Uh, what strategy really is, is a set of choices. It's a cascade of choices. And for those of you who have an interest in this, read this book. Uh, this is probably six or seven years ago. Uh, A.G. Laffley is the former and now again current chairman and CEO at P&G, Procter & Gamble. Uh, Roger Martin was an advisor uh, to Laffley uh, for many years there and was in the interim the dean of the Rotman School of Management at the University of Toronto, um, which is where I met him. And actually, Martin wrote a book in 2010 that convinced me to step down as CEO. I had been CEO at that point for 15 years, and when I read his original book, The Design of Business, which I'll touch on here in a second, that convinced me that I was not fit to be CEO of my company. So as chairman of the board, the board met and fired the CEO. What that means is I chose somebody else to take over as CEO. Luckily, my kid brother Derek, he's four years younger than I am, he's a finance guy. Uh, he had been chief operating officer for about three years at that point, and he was ready to take over. So uh, a big, big part of my maturation as an, as an executive or as an entrepreneur, what do you want to call me, um, history major, probably is more accurate. Uh, my maturation process was coming to terms with the limits of my capabilities. When I started the company, I had to do it all. And 15 years in, I realized I don't have to do it all anymore. I got all these fantastic people around, including my brother, who will do a much better job managing the company than I will. But these choices are uh, in sequence. You really can't do the choices on the right side of this cascade until you've done all the choices on the left side. Most companies spend their time in the strategy domain thinking about how they're going to win, the capabilities that are missing and that they have to build, and the managerial systems that are going to govern all that stuff. When in fact, they have not examined what their winning aspiration is in the first place, and where that winning aspiration will play, and where it won't play. Those are prerequisite choices that must be made before you can formulate the how to win answer. You can't do it. Well, you can make yourself believe you've done it. Let me correct myself. You'll feel like you did it. We refer to this as palliative analysis. Palliative analysis makes you more comfortable while you're dying. And I get to say this to CEOs and you know, boards of directors and all sorts of fun people like that, and they hate that a lot. They don't like that a bit. Because I'm holding up a mirror to the fact that they haven't made the winning aspiration choice in the first place. So this is uh, kind of a revolutionary idea. If you think about strategy as what's our winning aspiration? What, what's our right to win? Where will we play and where won't we play? Are there places in the marketplace that are unsuited for our winning aspiration? Of course there are. But you don't get a lot of points in corporate America by declaring that. How will we win? How we win in a particular place in the market is going to be different than in a different place. But you can't make those choices until you've chosen uh, where you're going to play. What capabilities are we going to need and what systems will manage those capabilities? Do you need a CRM system? I don't know. Is your winning aspiration, does your winning aspiration where you play and how you win require a CRM capability for you to do that or not? Because it's not a given. It's not yes all the time. Sometimes the answer is, I don't know. So you have to become very comfortable with ambiguity and the concept of ambiguity and the admission that you really don't know the answer, but you can find the answer. Um, Drucker always told us, this is from the 80s, but Drucker always told us that the most important changes aren't going to happen where you think they're happening. Most companies spend 99% of their insight resources studying their best customers. And their best customers are going to mislead them in a lot of ways to actually cut off their future. All the most important changes in the organization or to the organization from its markets are going to happen in places that where you're not looking, your non-customers specifically. And you have to ask the question, why aren't they buying what we have to sell? Why is our offer insufficient or out of alignment with the expectations of the market that it will reward with share. 
And most organizations have a really hard time asking such an esoteric question. But it's the only one that matters. Uh, this is the book that caused me to step down as CEO. Why? Because I realized I largely live up in this mystery world at the top of the knowledge funnel. This is a construct from design thinking. Have you guys heard the term design thinking? Hopefully, some of you have. Design thinking is the process of iterating a perfect solution through customer empathy. Understanding what customers really need as opposed to what they tell you they want. Most of the products that you're most passionate about in your life, most of the products that you use in your life or that your family uses in, a, in your life, those were produced as a result of a design thinking approach whereby they thought about your use case and then they designed the product around your use case. I'll give you a few examples here in a second. Um, entrepreneurs drive mysteries to heuristic. What that means is an entrepreneur has lots of different ways to solve a problem, kind of like a software engineer. There's a dozen different ways that you can solve a problem. What is the most valid method? What's the most valid hypothesis for solving that problem? That's the heuristic. The heuristic is the mental shortcut that the entrepreneur uses to solve the problem. But it's not reliable. It's unreliable. Why? Because people are operating the heuristic. Flawed human beings who make a lot of mistakes are operating those heuristics and consequentially the business can't grow. So even no matter how innovative a new company is, starting with mystery and driving that to heuristic, that's the way in which you manipulate the mystery. But it's going to be largely pretty dissociated from other ways to manipulate the mystery. Um, companies get big when they break through this uh, heuristic frontier into algorithm. What is the difference between an algorithm and a heuristic? A heuristic is operated by humans and makes mistakes. An algorithm removes the humans and makes it perfectly reliable. Software code is at the bottom of this funnel. Right down here, it's reduced to code. There are no humans involved in the process anymore of manipulating this mystery because it is perfectly reliable and no humans are gonna oversleep or forget to come to work that day, or wake up dead. There's a million different reasons why humans are gonna fail. Uh, and that's why you remove humans from the algorithm. Now this was a fairly shocking recognition to me, anyway, in 2009 when I read the book. And it made me realize, I'm an explorer. I live over here, and my kid brother's an exploiter. They're two different mindsets. The explorer really doesn't care about uh, profitability. They want to discover a new heuristic to manipulate the mystery with. The exploiter actually can't understand why the explorer doesn't want to turn that into an algorithm. Most business schools churn out exploiters like crazy. They're operators. They optimize the reliability and they perfect the algorithms by which the business operates in the marketplace so that variance is removed, and if possible, reduced to code. Explorers invent new businesses. They may have a software aspect to it. There may be a technology aspect to it in order to scale it. In fact, today there probably is in some way, shape, or form. Doesn't matter what business you're in. You're in the technology business. But it's not the way in which they're going to address the, that mystery. That mystery is going to be addressed in, a, in this new heuristic frontier way. So take an example like Uber. 10 years ago, it would have been unthinkable for you to land at Mitchell Airport and ask a stranger for a ride to Mequon. That was completely unthinkable until Uber developed the algorithm by which you call a stranger up, they accept your request, you pay them cashlessly, and then they drop you off wherever it is you want to go. It's how I travel now. I don't rent cars anymore. I get an Uber at whatever airport I land at, and they get me where I'm supposed to go. That is, that is what I'm talking about. That new mystery, how do we get strangers to drive each other around, and then we take a little off the top of each ride? That mystery was perfected to heuristic when the most valid way of manipulating that particular mystery was discovered by Uber and whoever else invented it that they copied. 
but it will not be perfected until humans are removed from the equation. What is the inevitable next step in the Uber algorithm? Autonomous vehicles. It's absolutely inevitable. Uber cannot achieve its scale without taking people out of that equation. So that's what I mean by this idea of the creative tension between explorers and exploiters. I have tremendous respect for exploiters because I just can't do it. I lose interest about the time I proved the hypothesis. I'm not really interested in getting it to scale. Almost every single person in my company is an exploiter. They're driven by, I don't even understand why you're interested in that, Eric. What's that gonna do for us? How do we get that to a point where we can make money on it? And for me, that's about the point at which I lose interest. Because um, I've proven the valid hypothesis. So consequentially, I'm a really rotten chief executive officer. And a big part of my 20-year-old self would have found that really, really hard to cope with. Because, hey, we've got to be great at everything, right? The, the illusion of omnicompetence, that we all have to be omnicompetent in every single thing we do. Well, uh, two weeks ago, Aurora celebrated its 25th anniversary. I started the company on my birthday, February 3rd, 1995. It's my 25th birthday, so I just turned 50, if you want to do the math. Um, it has been a very carefully negotiated surrender of responsibilities on my part to everybody else in the company. Now, I still take on new things. In fact, I do most of the new things in the business. I get most of those things started, but I don't finish almost any of them. I, I delegate them out to people who are able to drive that to scale and eventually reduce it to code, which is a big reason why I'm interested in Concordia. A big reason why I'm interested in Concordia is because I met Mike Littman back in November when I was here with Jeff and Amy. And we were wandering around outside his maker lab over there trying to find it. Amy and I were wandering around trying to find breakout areas so that when Jeff like, went into small group mode with his workshop, we knew where to take people. And as we're walking by, Mike sticks his head out of the maker lab and says, you guys lost? Or something to that effect, words to that effect. We said, uh, kinda. My name's Eric, what's your name? And Mike and I have been friends ever since. Um, and I believe God led me there, by the way. This is a part of the ministry journey that goes along with this, is uh, I'm looking for God's intervention in my business plan, because it's there. There's no question about it. God is guiding the business. My job is to detect what it is his will is leading us towards. And if I do that, I literally can't fail. Failure is not only not an option, it's not a possibility. Because there's a plan. And I don't have to take responsibility for that. And it's tremendously freeing. God led me to Mike. There's no question about it. And God's unfolding this plan around us. Now, what is disruption? Disruption is when a destabilizing force emerges in a relatively stable marketplace. Um, disruptors tend to look for jobs that are being done by people, and then they find a way to remove the people from that process. One of the aspects of Aurora's strategy uh, is something called meaningful work. Meaningful work means that uh, the work that you're doing not only has meaning to you, but it has meaning to the organization that you're doing it for, it has meaning to the community that you work in, it has meaning to your customers. I am very uh, sad to say that most people don't find a lot of meaning in their work. And a big part of my mission in life is to help people find meaning in their work. Often that means doing something else, finding a different thing. Sometimes it means becoming the right part of the right team, where the rest of the team is responsible for the things you just can't do. That's a big part of my story. I got one job, cast vision that's bold and believable and energizes the team to achieve it, and clear the way. Let them do it. That's all. It's the, it's the greatest job in the world. To be a disruptive innovator, though, you find jobs that are being done by people, and you take the people out. This is a Husqvarna robot lawnmower. Uh, it's basically a Roomba for your lawn. Uh, these things are about three grand. It'll mow a couple acres on a charge. Um, I live on a 40-acre farm south of Madison, so I'd need a small army of these things out kind of roaming around uh, the property in order to keep the lawn trimmed. Uh, but I've got 
think I got soybeans on it this last year. Uh, but the robot lawnmower is essentially an algorithm that was already proven in the context of vacuuming, right? All that all Husqvarna did was look for a human job, lawn mowing, and then figure out a way to remove the humans from that algorithm in order to perfect the algorithm and reduce it to code. Just like your Roomba, you program this thing with your mobile phone. This thing goes out, it mows your lawn at the appointed time when you tell it to, uh, and then it puts itself back into its charging station and recharges itself, all without your intervention. I mean, unless it like, falls off a ledge or you know, you gotta go fix it. Uh, but this thing is basically autonomous. Once you've trained it, it'll take it from there. And you have to change the batteries every five years kind of thing, because uh, then it won't take a charge anymore. But that's pretty much it. Um, this is how lawns will be mowed soon enough, because there is Humans have more meaningful work to do. Now, I'm actually working with uh, the Chamber of Commerce in Milwaukee, MMAC, on a study right now studying the impact of artificial intelligence and machine learning on the Milwaukee region, on the Seven County Milwaukee region. It's being uh, sponsored by uh, Milwaukee Development Corporation, also known as M7. Uh, they're the Economic Development Authority in charge of the Seven County region here. And so I've, one of my other interests in this area is to figure out what the impact of artificial intelligence is going to have on this economy. And we're finding out some really, really interesting things when you look through the eyes of an intelligence analyst. Um, one of the people that I got involved with the project is a guy named Dave Conley. Uh, Dave was the head of the uh, Worldwide Innovation Council at Intel Corporation for, for his last seven years at Intel. He basically worked with Intel to figure out what the next generation of uh, competition will look like after clock speed. And much of the definition of Intel's current dominance in the market was as a result of work that Dave did. Well, I met Dave 10 years ago, uh, and I got him involved in this project because I know that if anybody can reverse engineer the pathways of how artificial intelligence will evolve going forward, it's that guy. So we did that. Dave's actually working on it now. Uh, Mike, you were there as part of that uh, workshop last week. I invited Mike to come down. Uh, as one of our subject matter experts, and Blaine, you were able to tag along with him uh, and see some of that. That was a relatively tedious workshop, but Dave got everything he needs to reverse engineer how AI will evolve going forward using a system called TRIZ, T-R-I-Z. Uh, it's a Russian phrase, Teoria Reshenya Itzabrotatelskik Zadach, which is Russian for the theory of inventive problem solving. It's the reason why the Soviet Union didn't collapse in the 1950s, uh, and it took until the 80s for them to finally implode. But a lot of these concepts, this concept of the trend of S-curve evolution is explained through Tree's methodology. Um, I am pretty sure that we're going to walk out of the study with M7 with a pretty good understanding of how AI is going to evolve for the next 10 years, at least, and then what impact that will have on this particular region and the Milwaukee region's absorptive capacity for change. What will the region need to do in order to cope with the rogue wave that is coming in the form of, it, of artificial intelligence? It's a big deal. Um, a lot of strategy is formulated on the basis of extrapolating what happened last year. And if you've ever encountered the blue ocean concept, uh, that's a really, really important one for managers to understand and absorb. Because in order to formulate a new strategy, a new offer, you probably have to stop doing a lot of the things that you're currently doing. Because you have a cost structure in your business that's out of alignment with the superiority criteria that the market will reward with share. If you haven't read the book, that's as much of a summary I'll give you. This came out in about 2007. Um, and uh, in short, most managers can't do it. There's so much inertia behind a lot of the way their organization is structured, and they've got incentives that are there to prevent change rather than to sustain change, that they just can't, they just don't have the discipline for it. Um, a lot of what I'm for as an advisor is to help them come to terms with, with that reality, to bring enough perspective to it that they're able to see what must be done. And that's where superiority comes in. Uh, this guy is uh, Clayton Christensen. Uh, I got to work with Clay back in the mid-2000s as part of some work that I was doing with my professional society. Uh, but he is the popularizer of a uh, perspective on this called disruptive innovation. 
And Christensen was a Harvard professor. Uh, about seven, eight years ago, he had cancer. I think he had leukemia. Uh, that led to a heart attack and a stroke all in the same year. And he sort of wasn't the same ever since. Uh, but Christensen pushed these ideas of disruption and the impact that it has on successful companies. And the innovator's dilemma suggests it's a classic conundrum for business titans. How much money and attention should be focused on a new but growing operation that is far less profitable than the core business? Man, that's tough to do. That is really, really hard to do. All of this AI stuff happening out there right now is probably not cash flow positive for the big companies in this region. In fact, uh, it may be actually revenue destructive for them in their top line. And so coping with and understanding how those changes are going to ultimately impact their business models are really tough recognition of reality. This is the bottom half of what's known as the S curve. S stands for sinusoid because it goes up and to the right. This is stage one and stage two. And this describes how all disruptive technologies evolve. They all begin being relatively low quality and through a series of sustaining innovations eventually reach the most demanding use. What I don't have on this S curve is when it crests into stage three. Stage three means that its performance improvement radically levels off and stage four of decline describes that technology's eventual uh, uh, superseding by another definition of performance that the market didn't know that it needed. A new S curve, in other words, emerges down here. And the stage three dominant technology says, that thing sucks. That's never going to be anything. Uh, we don't have to worry about that at all. Because look how terrible it is. It's so low performance, barely anybody wants it, and nobody wants to pay for it. And then through this series of sustaining innovations, it slowly climbs this curve until it then rapidly climbs the curve and becomes the industry standard. This is how all disruptive technologies work. And I say the word all very, very intentionally there. It also happens to be the way all business models work. All new business model innovation starts out being relatively terrible. And then through a series of sustaining innovations, they reach a point where it radically improves into stage three. It moves into stage four, which is decline, and then the only use for that technology or business model is typically a nostalgic hobbyist form. So, uh, you know, uh, photographic film, for example. You can still get it, but it's expensive, and it's only used by people who are hobbyist photographers because digital technology overtook that existing S-curve so long ago, and it superseded the quality that you could achieve from actual physical film. Kodak, unfortunately, could not cope with that reality because it was actually more profitable to make film than it was to make $100 bills. And so everything in their incentive reality was aligned to sustain that stage three. As stage three was imposed upon them as stage four, Kodak inevitably went away. They couldn't look into the void without turning away. The void is the future. By the way, God's already written the future. And it's really, really cool to see it revealed as, as you're able. That's what intelligence is. So a few years ago, uh, I sort of started documenting some of this stuff because Christensen was kind of a downer. Basically, his message to all established successful companies was, you're screwed. Sucks to be you. You're going out of business soon. Sorry. Um, and that wasn't really good enough for me. And so I decided there must be a way to change that perspective. And so um, I started thinking in terms of the way uh, an airfoil hits, or in other words, a wing hits a, a current of air. And so if you think about the wing on an airplane, um, the relationship between the airflow and the foil has a lot to do with how you correct the S curve in order to make that S curve more sustainable. There are dynamics, it turns out, that are revealed in all of that. And how those dynamics reveal themselves allow you to reprogram your superiority so that the marketplace will reward you a share in a more consistent and continuous way. But you have to be intentional about it. Uh, we call this superiority analysis. And it begins with four 
generic growth strategies. The first of these is the alpha strategy, that incremental innovation that I was talking about earlier. This is an S-curve. It just is depicted as a straight line here so that the relationship with market criteria is easier to understand. So high quality use, low quality use, and somewhere bridging those demand definitions, definition of performance as it increases over time, we'll call the sweet spot. When your offer hits that nice sweet spot, you can then start to spread out across the market definition of performance with other offers that essentially saturate the total available market and you take over. You can take over the market in a very, very predictable way. The problem with alphas are that alphas have every incentive to keep improving the offer. And here's another iron law of innovation. Customer expectations, in other words, the degree at which performance will increase, will always increase at a slower rate than the offer's ability to increase its performance. What does that mean? What are the consequences of that dynamic? It means that alphas have a tendency to overshoot. They have a tendency to have products in the marketplace that are too complicated, too expensive, too hard to buy, too hard to use, too hard to get rid of when you're done, et cetera, ad nauseum. Those products are out of alignment with the criteria that the market will reward with share, and when you reach a condition of overshoot, there's insufficient demand to support your cost structure. So think of every big company in history that's ever failed, Kodak being my example a second ago. They allowed themselves to arrive at a condition of overshoot and did not correct the angle of attack. Correcting the angle of attack is this angle right here. The difference between the angle of the improvement of performance of your offer and the angle of improvement or increasing customer expectations. Turns out, trees and trends of S-curve evolution have figured this out a long time ago. I mean, the Soviets figured this out. This isn't anything new. Um, this is describing a condition of capitalism that is just the way it works. It's just reality. And how those dynamics work in competitive markets dictate how these S-curves will eventually overshoot what the market expectations are. Now, what happens when an alpha overshoots? It creates an opportunity for a beta to emerge in the market. They usually are much quicker to reach the sweet spot. They start out at similar degrees of underperformance, and they understand what these guys are doing wrong, and then they're able to more sufficiently correct the angle of attack of the increasing performance of their offer with customer expectations. That's all. Betas are great. Turns out my company, Aurora, is really, really good at beta. I used to think we were uh, a different kind of growth company. Turns out we're a beta. That's really hard to swallow, by the way. That's really hard to come to terms with. But this definition of performance is one that, for this marketplace, they didn't even know they needed in the beginning. They didn't know that their expectations of performance were right here. So I'll date myself here a little bit, and I'll ask you young people, um, how many of you, well, I'll ask you about your parents. How many of your parents knew that they were going to have to carry their entire music collection around with them on their phone 20 years ago? None of them. Because 20 years ago, this didn't exist. The ability to take your entire music collection with you wherever you went was called one of those big CD binders. You know, you've, your parents have one at home. It's filled with a bunch of CDs, Def Leppard, you know, that type of stuff. Um, and I had one when I was in high school. And how did I take my entire music collection with me? I had this giant binder. And in that binder, I had probably 200 CDs. And I'd pull a CD out, I'd stick it in the stereo, and I'd listen to it. That's how music was consumed. When uh, MP3 and peer-to-peer -peer emerged, suddenly consumers didn't have to pay $19 for a CD with one good song on it. You could download your friend's song or some anonymous stranger's song on Napster and illegally trade in this intellectual property. All Apple did, all Steve Jobs did with iTunes and iPod was to commercialize and make legal this illegal trade in intellectual property. Basically went to the record labels and said, look guys, singles, 99 cents. End of story. Get in line. I'm building a business around this. And the iTunes ecosystem was born. 
iTunes, of course, has evolved into a new performance curve. Back in those days, iTunes was the definition of performance. Now, what is the definition of performance for music consumption today? Streaming, exactly. Totally, totally, totally predictable. This was completely predictable. How? Because the trend of S-curve evolution has two subtrends associated with it. One of those subtrends is the trend of increasing customer expectations. The second one is the trend of decreasing human involvement, and that leads to a third subtrend called the trend of evolution to the super system, meaning that elements of the system actually go away as the system integrates those elements into it. Eventually, none of you will walk around with a phone in your pocket. You will speak out loud in the air, and computing will happen. Communications will happen. Um, banking transactions will happen. I did it the whole way here. I was on, I was hey siri like crazy the whole way here. Um, and Siri was executing my will, uh, and I never looked at my phone. Um, so this new definition of performance in my example is streaming. There is another definition of performance that comes after streaming. You guys might have the idea. Now this is called gamma. Angle of attack gamma redefines what the new performance dimension will be or should be or could be. In the case of the iTunes ecosystem, it was, you don't have to carry that big binder full of CDs around anymore. I'm going to put it all on your iPod, and you're going to keep it on you at all times so that you can listen to music wherever you go. The same is true of all mobile devices. Mobile is a really fascinating example here. Um, the RIM BlackBerry being one of those prototypical examples. Of course, none of you have used a BlackBerry because they're out of business. They're out of that business, sort of, debatably. Uh, the RIM BlackBerry uh, redefined performance in the mobile device space, and it's not what you think it was. In the old days, the mobile device space was defined by the mobile telephone, and the primary application for that performance curve was telephony, real-time one-to-one communications between one person and another without wires. What RIM did was it moved down this z-axis into a new definition of performance and started packing smart smarts onto the phone. The BlackBerry essentially put messaging on the phone, so now you didn't have to, while you're waiting in line to see if you got your first class upgrade at the airport, you didn't have to whip out your Windows, what was in those days, probably Windows NT, uh, which was the professional sort of business class version of Windows, um, and wait as you went through a couple of blue screens of death to eventually get your inbox open so you could see whether you have any email that you need to process, and by then, the flight is boarding. What BlackBerry did was it redefined performance. It made productive time out of otherwise unproductive time spent waiting. I'll say it again. The BlackBerry made productive time out of otherwise unproductive time spent waiting. Because you could stand in line while you're waiting for your upgrade, you whip your BlackBerry out, you bang out a bunch of emails, there's no alpha. The, the old alpha was Windows NT. They overshot a long time ago. What's a good characteristic of an overshooting operating system? When it takes five minutes to boot. That's a really good example of an overshooting operating system. Now, there were other simpler betas that emerged in that market. Linux is a good example of that. What happened with BlackBerry? It redefined what mobile computing and communications was. Apple did the same thing in 2007 with the iPhone. And where, did, where do you suppose Apple got the idea for the iPhone? Which was, fundamentally, let's take the keyboard off the BlackBerry and merge it with iTunes. Where do you think they got the idea for a widescreen internet uh, pocket device that had a desktop operating system on it? They got the idea from Linux. Linux started a, pro a project known as uh, Android in 2005. For those of, I was a history undergrad, so you have to forgive my histori historicity here. Uh, Android was two years older than the iOS, the ver first version of iOS. And it was done by cramming a full-on desktop version of Linux onto a Symbian handset. So being able to put a desktop operating system on a mobile device, that was the innovation. The innovation was, I have desktop computing on a device that I can carry around with, with me wherever I go, and it instantly flashes on. Those gammas redefined performance 
and as a consequence, make the old definition of performance irrelevant. Nobody cares what, you guys don't care about BlackBerry because it's no longer relevant to how you guys use mobile computing and communications. That something is coming, by the way, which will change it again. When you don't know what that thing is, we call that a delta. A delta is the thing that's coming that redefines performance, but we don't know what it is yet. Why? Because we haven't sold any of them. The difference between a delta and a gamma is that delta becomes gamma when one unit is sold. When you sell one to somebody, you are now in gamma. And you can work your way up the offer until you reach enough of a market that you can build a business around that. Now I'm very tightly compressing this whole content and this lesson so that I can get through it before our time's up. Um, but this concept applies to every single growth strategy in human history, including Jesus, if you want to uh, have a conversation about that. So all I've done in the last 25 years is to take those concepts and apply it to a corporation. Aurora WDC is uh, short for Aurora Worldwide Development Corporation, which was the name I came up with when I had no idea what I was going to do. And it needed to be pretty much valid for almost anything. And it took me a couple of years of putzing around before I finally discovered competitive intelligence. But uh, I realized that competitive intelligence wasn't that hard. I could learn how to do this. My very first competitive intelligence assignment was a worldwide market analysis for a place called the California Emu Ranch. You know what an emu is? It's kind of like an ostrich, but smaller. Turns out emu meat and oil and feathers and all the products that come out of the whole emu ecosystem is super, super healthy and cheap to produce and good for you and all this stuff that goes along with that. Um, well, in the late 1990s, this was a major bubble. This was like the tulip bubble in the Netherlands, you know, 400 years ago. Um, and you, you'd spend $50,000 to buy a breeding pair of emus. They're obviously not worth that anymore, um, but the California emu ranch had 50,000 breeding pairs of emus. 50,000 pairs, 100,000 emus out running around in the middle of the California wilderness. And they were selling all sorts of products from that. And they had the benefit of a marketplace that was ready to buy. But they also knew that its market saturation here in America was running out. So they hired me to go out and figure out where the fastest markets were going to be for those emu products. I didn't know anything about emus. I didn't know anything about forecasting. I didn't know anything about global economics. I had to figure it out. And I also figured out how undercharged I made the project. I should have charged them 10 times what I charged. But uh, you never know that until after you screw that up a few times. Um, and then you realize, man, this is worth a lot more than what I asked for. Um, I should charge more. Uh, those origins are what we today call Aurora GPS, Aurora Global Professional Services. Aurora GPS is, a, is an analytical consulting firm within the corporation. Uh, it specializes in global human intelligence elicitation. It covers about 100 countries around the world. And what Aurora GPS does for its clients is to go out and talk to primary sources, people who actually have familiarity with the local economy, the local competitive uh, environment, the local marketplace, and then synthesize those perspectives. I've joked that GPS also stands for Global Perspectives and Synthesis, but Global Professional Services is what it officially means. But we synthesize those perspectives to give a much more complete uh, appreciation of reality. Back to that cylinder. You think it's a cylinder when it's really a wedge. But you won't know that until you get the perspective that reveals that it's a wedge. Right? So that's basically what Aurora GPS does. Roughly 50% of our revenue comes from that consulting business. Um, in 2005, 10 years in, uh, I had realized that uh, this thing's a big beast. And we're trying to swing around this big beast of a consulting firm without any automation at all. And so I decided in 2005 that we needed to start a software system, uh, which would probably be only ours. We would probably just use it ourselves to manage this intelligence network. And I showed it to a client of mine 
at a local uh, CPA and accounting and uh, consulting firm, Whipfly. Whipfly Ulrich Bertelson was their original name back in those days. But if you've heard of Whipfly, uh, they're based, I think, now in the Twin Cities. But uh, Whipfly at the time uh, was a client of ours. And one of my clients there got a peek at this internal system that we had built. In those days, it was called DMS, uh, which is short for, I think it was Data Management Services or something like that, which was like our internal department that managed all of this stuff that later became known as GPS. So uh, that system uh, got seen by the chief growth officer at Whipley, a guy named Kurt Halbeck. And Kurt said, what's it going to cost me to get you to build me a system like that? And I put my head together with my kid brother and I said, 100 grand? That sounds fair. We usually ask for too little, so maybe we should go 200 grand. And so we asked, we said, 100,000 bucks. And Kurt's like, done. When can I have it? He bought it. We didn't expect him to buy it. I mean, this thing's kind of crappy. We just sort of use it internally. Um, we're going to have to like, make it nice now. It's got to look good. And like, he's got people internally who are going to use this thing. What are we going to do? So we hired a guy named Greg Irvin. Uh, Greg at the time was a systems architect for Runsheimer International here in Milwaukee. Um, he did all sorts of economic modeling work and wrote code to, to do that stuff. And uh, we got together and had a bunch of beers. And of course, you know what happens when you drink a bunch of beer together. All sorts of ideas happen as a result of that. And so we decided that Greg should be our CTO. So we hired Greg. Uh, Greg today, 14 and a little more years later, is still our chief technology officer. Um, he runs the technology business, which is today called First Light. If you're curious where we got the name, the word Aurora means first light of dawn. And so first light is the name of the software business. It's based here in Milwaukee because Greg is usually based here in Milwaukee. Most of the people who work in the first light business are based here in Milwaukee. Um, and first light uh, as a software company is probably going to grow here in the Milwaukee area, which is one of my ulterior motives for being here today is to recruit you guys to potentially come help me build the next version of first light. Uh, so First Light's got about 14 years of history on it, and uh, as First Light was growing, First Light today is about 50% of our revenue. So we've got this consulting firm, about half, and the other half's called First Light, and it's, uh, we've got about 40 enterprise clients around uh, mostly North America, a couple in Europe. Um, these are companies, the names of which you would recognize, but uh, the identities of whom I cannot disclose. If you walked into their shop and said, show me your First Light system, it would not look like we made it. It would look like they made it. And that's one of the key drivers in the superiority criteria for a, an intelligent software system. It has to look like they made it. So uh, one of our clients, reference clients, is Dunkin' Brands. Have you ever been to a Dunkin' Donuts or Baskin Robbins? They're the brand owner of all of those, uh, all of those, of that business. For about 10 years now, we have been the infrastructure provider for Dunkin's competitive market and strategic intelligence function. So when Duncan produces intelligence output, that is actually produced by us. And so when the CEO sees it, the CEO says, wow, look at this genius intelligence output that you guys produced. High five, nice job, you get a raise. That's our job. Our job is to make the senior intelligence officer inside uh, the Fortune 1000 look like a rock star. And we're pretty good at it, if I do say so myself. Uh, in 2010, I stepped down as CEO, really to kind of figure out what was next, and I started a new business called Reconverge. Uh, Reconverge is our learning business. And Reconverge is not yet cash flow positive. We're about eight years in. Uh, we've spent more money on Reconverge than it's made us back, but I believe it's our logarithm. If you think of uh, arithmetic as the example, the GPS business, the consulting side of the business, that's an addition business. In order to add clients, I gotta add people. And those people have to be really smart, and they're usually really expensive. Um, the first slide business is our multiplication business. I can add clients with adding just a few people, so it's more like multiplication. I can add two engineers, and we can, that can get us 10 new clients, each worth between 50 and $250,000 a year, the way our business model is set up. Um, and there's a cross-sale opportunity. If you're a First Light client, you're very likely to use us for professional services as well and vice versa. If you're a professional services client, you're very likely to buy our software. So in 
the early 2010s, this idea of reconverge emerged. I hired a guy named Craig Fleischer. He's our chief learning officer today. He was dean of a business school in, Florida, or, uh, in Georgia, an old friend of mine. Uh, in fact, Craig was the chairman of the board of directors of the Strategic and Competitive Intelligence Professionals of our professional society the same year I was the chair of the conference committee, 2006. Guess who my keynote speaker was in 2006 in Orlando? Clay Christensen. Clay is about, or was, about 6'9". Craig's about 5'2". I'm about 6'2". So the, the running joke that week was that if Craig is tall, then I'm a grande and Christensen was a venti. Uh, to put it into per, perspective in uh, Starbucks nomenclature. But um, that's how I got into disruption theory. And that's where I really found kind of what Aurora's next business was going to be. So reconverge is really the training process of training up new analysts. Today, uh, the sort of jewel in the crown of reconverge is called reconverge G2. Uh, this year it's happening at uh, UW Madison in the Fluno Center on the campus there of the business school. Um, April 21st through the 23rd. Mike, I'm going to talk to you about sending a group of students over for that, if possible, um, to, uh, to hammer on that. But essentially what that meeting is, is the smartest people at the biggest corporations in America sending their intelligence analysts to Madison for us to show them a bunch of stuff that they didn't even know existed. It's a very, very demanding um, conference. This year's conference, there's actually pre-work and post-work. Uh, the pre-work is the construction of utopian and dystopian scenarios of how artificial intelligence is going to impact your business model. Now, I'll tell you that we have some companies that have already registered for this. One of those companies is Northrop Grumman. Uh, Northrop is, uh, usually sends a team of between 5 and 10. Uh, this year, they've got about five people coming, and they're going to work through the programming of a growth strategy for the aerospace and defense business. Um, I know that they are going to walk in on Tuesday, April 21st with a really elaborate utopian scenario and a really elaborate dystopian scenario. And the yield from that day will be a hybridized version of the scenario narrative and their chosen growth strategy as to how they're going to exploit it. Go to bed or go to karaoke kid across the street if you want to hang with me. I will close the place down. We do uh, every night for about four nights in a row. Uh, I'm not very good at karaoke, but that doesn't stop me uh, from enjoying it. Uh, so uh, Wednesday, we'll come back in now with your chosen growth strategy and your most probable scenario. And we are going to walk you through the trends of engineering system evolution. What are the S curves that will actually be programmable in order to produce the outcome that you have programmed? Go to bed or come to Karaoke Kid with me. Uh, come back on Thursday, and on Thursday, we are going to test your growth strategy in a war game and competitive simulation where the market determines the superiority criteria. Other producers in the market, the consumers in the market, and then the community in the market will develop superiority criteria that your offer has to survive. And then we pick winners. And we probably give away trophies, and then we go to Karaoke Kid, as you might admit. Um, so that's, that's the G2 meeting. Uh, it's the biggest week of my year, every year, and the most tiring uh, to boot. But these three companies, these three businesses, all operate together within Aurora as a corporation. Um, and as we have sort of uh, put this together, this is my second superiority analysis. Now, if that looks vaguely familiar, these are actually S-curves that I drew at a retreat that was held at Grand Avenue Mall in downtown Milwaukee in January of 2019. Every January we go away for a week, uh, and that particular week we chose Milwaukee as the place to go away to. And we rented out part of Grand Avenue Mall, it's under, uh, they were remodeling. And uh, I plotted this on a whiteboard in a guy's office in Grand Avenue Mall. Um, this basically tells the history of Aurora. This tells the history in one slide of how Aurora began in 1995, got into the software business in 2005, really got into the learning business about 2013, and then how those have evolved. And this is our competitive set in the middle. We are closing ranks on that competitive set, and I guarantee you we will take over that part of the market. Market, P1, performance curve one, which I define as actionable insights, 
will be all ours. I absolutely guarantee it, because I know exactly how to program superiority for those three businesses. What's the problem? That market's getting smaller. So I'm about to be number one in a shrinking market, which means that if I want my company to be around for another 25 years, I gotta move out down the Z axis and figure out what P2 is. What's the new definition of performance? I'm working on that right now. I think I know what it is, but I'm testing it. I'm not gonna, because then you might go out and do it before I do, and now I've just created an army of competitors that I have to go confront. <laughs> not a good strategy, by the way. Uh, but if you get enough beer in me, I'll probably tell you. Uh, so the angles of attack for Aurora, this is the, so this is the cleaned up version of this. The angles of attack for Aurora looks at those three businesses and then plots the increasing performance expectations of our market. It also looks at the programmable growth as being the definition of performance now emerging over the course of the prior decade in gamma, and it also shows me delta. This delta is one I'm working on now. I've proven that we can do this. I'm now working on the delta. And the delta has to be brought into reality when I sell one. Once I sell one unit, it's in gamma. And gamma means I can improve upon it in order to unlock whatever this new alpha will be. My job as a growth programmer is to align that angle of attack with all of the expectation tiers within the marketplace in order to produce a predictable growth strategy going forward. Got, the, got all that? Any questions about all that? I know that's a lot of material. What I've done for you is I've boiled down how innovation and strategy and growth is a very, very, very predictable thing. And it took a history major to figure it out because losers define what you don't want to do. As long as you've removed all the things that you don't want to do, it's inevitable that you will succeed with the things you do want to do. So it's a process of elimination. There's a bunch of heuristics that go along with this. This gives you an appreciation for kind of how the company is set up. If you think about the activities within the company, uh, Reconverge really provides guidance and leadership through a bunch of different activities that we do over there. First light is really real-time monitoring and um, early warning. So how do we detect early warning of market events when nobody can see what's going to happen in the future? Well, it turns out the future is quite predictable. You just need to understand what indicators and warnings will constitute the superiority that the market will reward with share, and then do that. Those that were within your control factors. Yes? Okay. Uh, and then the professional services business has this application portfolio and then fulfills uh, on-demand projects in an episodic way. So not, it's not something that we do regularly. We do it when it's ask us for those things. That's, I'm done. So my question may or may not have been covered in your presentation, but if you have a big client, take Kodak, for example, if they were never able to go down the Z-axis to figure out, like, here's what P2 is, when they're a big corporation like Kodak is, would they have been agile enough to actually jump on to P2 and say, okay, here's the S-curve that we need to get on? Yeah. Because Yep, that's a great question. And a lot of it boils down to the incentives. Um, there was a trend in American business, uh, late 1960s and continuing through to today, uh, called um, maximizing shareholder value. And usually the definition of maximizing shareholder value was an appreciation of the stock price plus an occasional dividend. But dividends are really terrible from a tax strategy standpoint because you pay twice. You, you got a tax on the original dividend, you got a tax on uh, the income that you pay as a shareholder. So most companies don't dividend anymore. Uh, there's no incentive to do it. But all of the American economy and most capitalist economies around the world have been set up for shareholder value maximization. Turns out that's not the primary role of a corporation. The primary role of a corporation is actually, to use Drucker's words from about ago, is to create a customer. You're not there to maximize shareholder value. You're there, you're there to multiply customers. Now that changes the perspective substantially. Had Kodak had the will, and I will say the humility, that was the prerequisite to make bold move to move into P2, yes, they could have done it. They failed 
and it's on them. And in fact, when people come to the Reconverge G2 meeting, when I send them home when we're done, I usually send them home uh, with uh, the words, no excuses. You now know how it's all going to happen. So if you fail, that's on you, brother. Uh, that's really what the definition of leadership is, I think, in the 21st century. Back to that whole infinite game thing. Remember? You didn't lose. You ran out of time. You didn't have the time with which uh, was required to play out the infinite game. Most managers in American business uh, are poorly incentivized to be infinite players, to be thinking about what happens to this corporation when I'm gone. How do you know? because they behave in, in ways that maximize their incentive outcomes at, for them personally. Everything you see in operations in America today are to maximize individual performance outcomes, not the sustainability of the business. And a lot of that has to do with this whole idea of shareholder value maximization too. We've created this sort of warped structure that I don't think is sustainable. I don't think it's sustainable in the 21st century. Anyway, we're gonna have to model. Not necessarily rethinking capitalism, but rethinking how business exploits capitalism as a dynamic of human behavior. Did you have a hand up for a reason back there? Okay. Um, yep. Yeah. So is it selfish? Yeah. Um, I think that it depends on the incentives that have been created. You know, humans are fight or flight creatures. You have a thing in your brain called the amygdala, and the amygdala is how you prioritize your choices. Usually they are very instinctive. They aren't based on rational thought. And so for those of you analysts in the room, typically what happens is you make an emotional choice based on your appetites and your fears. And then you look for data that helps you feel better about that choice. So, phew, there's data that shows that I was, you know, pick that option instead of the other options. Um, and I don't think that's how decision making is going to be done going forward. Not in a world where you can model out all the possible options and all the possible outcomes on a simulation. And if you can simulate all possible outcomes, then I mean, obvious which direction to take. You know, you won't have to look for palliative data that makes you feel better while you're dying. I think that's actually probably our outcome for the AI study that I mentioned earlier with M7, is we're going to see that artificial intelligence will allow us to model out a lot of, a lot of the outcomes. God's already modeled all those outcomes out, FYI. Um, and reveal what those outcomes could potentially be in order so that you can make the choices necessary on your control factors in order to produce those outcomes. So yeah, it's selfish. But I think the social contract in capitalist societies or market economies is one where it works for me. It should also work for the community. And I think that's the critique of capitalism that I see today is it's not working for the community as often as it used to because people are using algorithmic thinking in order to play the system. Take stocks as a good example of that. I personally don't own any public security anymore. I sold out in about 2003 when I needed to make a payroll. Uh, and cashed out my 401k in order to keep the company afloat. And I haven't owned securities since, uh, mostly because I've been on insider lists and it's really hard for me to trade uh, securities for a, a lot of the companies that at the time I was advising. Um, but I won't more. Uh, why? Because high frequency trading means that a, a position in a particular security is very, very temporary. Um, I, think it's, I think in spite of all the uh, the gains that I've missed out on in the last decade, and I've missed out on a lot of gains, trust me. Um, those gains are largely imaginary, or locked in, or permanent. So that's, I think, temporary results are not necessarily indicative of permanent trends. Sir, do you have your hand up? Yahoo's a good example of an alpha that was unable to, over, to correct its overshoot. Um, Yahoo kept doing a lot of the same stuff that it had been doing because that same stuff was successful. Even as Google was shifting the definition of performance in what web media was all about. Um, if you think about the search engine Google created, P2 was paid search. 
um, and you used your AdWords account to essentially target the search uh, results that you wanted to optimize and rank highly in, and then you paid Google for the privilege of producing those results. Yahoo was a late entrant to that new P2, and they just couldn't catch up. Google drove a weaponized algorithm that was just so much further advanced. And how, how do I know? Because all the customers bought it from them. If customers had rewarded Yahoo with sufficient share, could Yahoo have existed as a beta alongside Google? Sure. But they were, the analogy that I use with a Yahoo example is, when you've got five different offers in the market, it's the same as trying to defend yourself by poking somebody with five fingers. That's not a very good way of defending yourself. You need to make a fist. You need to concentrate your force into one punch. And that's exactly what Google did. Google won that fight because Yahoo was poking you with five fingers, poking the market with five fingers, and, Yahoo, and Google was punching. Google also vastly diversified its business. And it got into, uh, take Gmail. Gmail was an idea that uh, was produced competitively by the team, and they introduced it. I think it's still in beta, technically. I think, I think Gmail is technically still in beta. Is it? Yeah, exactly. And Gmail's fundamental proposition was, you don't need to have uh, localized email storage in a web browser in the cloud. Back in those days, they didn't call it the cloud. They didn't know what to call it. Um, it was SaaS, you know, software as a service. And this idea of software as a service was really, really hard for big enterprise clients or customers to buy because that meant our data was on somebody else's infrastructure. We can't have our customer's infrastructure. Um, there's a great frontline uh, expose. It was on PBS last night. Um, go to pbs.org and find the frontline show from last night about Amazon.com. Uh, Amazon changed that entire game by getting the CIA to buy a private cloud. They sold this agency a private cloud, and that legitimized for everyone the concept of web services. And that's really, that's really where Amazon Web Services came from, was that legitimacy. Um, I see a hand back there. Yes, sir. My CTO can answer that question in a much better way than I can because that's no longer my job. Um, but I will say we have our own, I think it's a, they call it an edge cloud now, um, I think is the terminology behind it. I, actually Blaine and Eric might know better than I do since you guys, not, you guys don't know yet. Uh, so uh, the infrastructure now is, it's a distributed architecture where some of it lives inside the client uh, firewall and some lives outside the client firewall. Um, one of the business strategies in bringing the beta of first the marketplace, I'll go back here. When First Light came into the market, um, starting a software company inside a consulting firm is really, really dangerous because it usually means that both businesses are going to fail. The only way we were able to do it was down here when First Light was originated. We built it on an open source content management system called Drupal. So if you're familiar with Drupal at all, it's a PHP, LAMP stack, um, content management system. And on top of that, Greg started building iterations of this intelligence management system until we sold one. And when we sold one to Kurt Hallbeck, my chief product officer at Aurora today. Um, so my original software client now works for Aurora. And he run, he's had a product. Um, Kurt gave us 100 grand to build the first one, and then we took it from there. Um, and so today, First Light still runs on Drupal. There's still a Drupal core to it, because there's a million Drupal developers in the world, and they take care of everything. I don't have to have those developers on my balance sheet, do I? I don't have to worry about getting sued by somebody who says, they've got a business method patent for my authentication system. Go talk to Drupal about it. So open source was really a key strategy for First Light back in 2005. Today, boy, don't ask me how they run it. It's a lot better than it used to be. It's a lot better than it was when I set up the first web server that it, that it sat on. Actually, when I taught Greg how to, how to configure a web server, believe it or not, um, the history major could figure that stuff out too. Uh, but I'm never going to be the person who brings that thing 
to perfection or actually builds a business that makes money out of it. That's always going to be somebody else at Aurora. I start things, I don't finish things. So Eric, yes. Uh, Robert Everhart, the guy that asked the question, good friend of mine, works in the industry. I'll get him in a room with Greg. Cool. Fantastic. I look forward to hearing more being a fly on the wall. Other questions about this? I'm going to kind of wrap up um, my remarks here. So uh, what is superiority? Superiority is defining what the criteria is that the market will reward with share. There's three kinds. Satisfiers are expects you to perform up to a threshold or a boundary condition. And then almost everybody over delivers on satisfiers. Why? Because they're easy. It's easy to think that you're delighting a customer by over delivering on something that they are unwilling to pay for. What's an example of a satisfier? Well, he pays extra at a restaurant for a clean plate. That's a satisfier. You expect the plate to be clean, but you don't expect it necessarily to be sanitary. I mean, come on, it's a restaurant. For crying out loud, there's food and germs and stuff in there. Um, the extra cheese on your pizza question. You want extra cheese on your pizza? Nah, forget it. That's a satisfier. When there's enough cheese on your pizza, and you won't pay extra for it. Now, the irony of all this is, Almost every company in the world over delivers like crazy on satisfiers because their customers tell them, yeah, we want more of that. We really love your quality. Oh, quality's key. We got, wait a second, will they pay extra for it? No, well, then it's a satisfier. Drivers are things that the market will pay extra for and which are temporarily competitively different enough that you can take share. Drivers, are, well, actually, there are three responses to drivers. If you're in a competitive market with a bunch of other people who do the same thing that you're doing, and somebody develops a driver, and the market starts to shift, and you start losing customers to that company, you have three options, and only three. You can imitate it, you can be driver, in order to stalemate the market and restore a balanced, stable market share. Stopping the bleeding. This is like a tourniquet, you know, on your wound, essentially. You can attempt to leapfrog the marketplace. In other words, you try to overperform at a level the market never, and reverse the trend of uh, market share erosion so that that market share now swings back to you again. Leapfrogs are typically pretty hard to do uh, because you have to not only come up with the copy strategy, you've got to have some breakthrough that gets you way past it. But if you do it, you'll be rewarded with it. Now, the third and final opportunity or option for a driver criterion is surrender. Most organizations have a really, really hard time with surrender. I do not. I know when to surrender on superiority criteria of a competitor. Surrender mean? It means, usually in my situation, it means we partner with them. We partner with whoever that is whose driver is more competitively rewarding than ours is so that I can restore a condition of stalemate to my market share position in, in the industry. That's it. Those are your three. Get really, really creative with these three options. And you have to remember the word temporary. They are temporarily effective in driving share attraction. They are not permanent because of these three eventual outcomes. So the hardest conversations I have are where I say, listen guys, you should give up. You should surrender. You should sell that business because it's at its peak value right now and reinvest those profits in something else. I'll give you an example. Um, Philips, the uh, Dutch technology food, and they sell all kinds of stuff. Uh, Philips products that you encounter might be the Sonicare toothbrush. Philips makes the Sonicare toothbrush is a good example. Back in the 90s, uh, Philips was in the music business. And they had uh, a music label. I blank on the name now. One of you knows, I'm sure. Um, I'll think of it probably on my drive home. They had a music label, and it was one of the top five uh, record labels in the music industry. Uh, the CEO at Philips realized that selling CDs had no future. And so they put the music label, record label, up for sale. 
They put it up for sale. Maximum profits, maximum revenue. Growth was really good. It was the year before iTunes came to market. And most of their defense against MP3 and P2P and the cultural transition of, you know, a $19 CD with one good song on it, that pent up demand that made iTunes and that entire downloads the next P, the next performance definition, um, they sold it to Seagram's, the company that makes all the boots, basically. Um, and Seagram's bought this record label and they paid through the nose to get into the music business. It was a terrible decision. It was a great decision for Philips to put it up for the bottom fell out of the music industry the next year and continued to erode for years to come. What did Philips do there? They surrendered. They said, we can't run this music business in a way that will allow it to have a sustainable future. We're going to sell it, and we're going to take the capital that that raises to invest in other areas. Surrender can often look like. We're getting out. We're, out, we're going out of business intentionally. We're going out of that business anyway. Now, the most fun um, part of superiority criteria are disruptors. Disruptors are the things that the market doesn't know that it needs yet. The disruptors happen most often in gamma and delta, where you're completely redefining the performance expectations. Uh, disruptors are tough because they call into question the original performance definition, and nobody knew that they needed it. Incumbents like Kodak have a really, really hard time dealing with disruptor criteria like digital, digital photography, because it undermines their original selling film and when everything's digital. That doesn't make any sense. How are we going to have a business there? What are they going to buy? Um, it's an unproven hypothesis. They don't know that anybody wants it, particularly if it's in Delta. If it's Delta and it's pre-sales, you haven't even sold one unit yet, how are you going to try and put, bet the ranch on that? Industry success. No way to forecast the growth of a disruptor set of criteria. So the way you do it is you look for jobs for hire. You look for jobs for hire in adjacent markets, and then you figure out how to take humans out of that job. That's the easiest way to program disruptor criteria into any market. You could probably name a million examples on how to do that. So this is a little bit of a cheat sheet. I use this with clients and basically say, all you got to do is print this out and like refer back to it. And then I guarantee every word on this slide will apply to your business no matter what business you're in. It's pretty robust. And you should build. So these are really the missions of what intelligence is there to do. And it also describes the control factors that a company has under its umbrella of activities in order to program its future, in order to program its growth strategy. There are the factors that you control. In other words, the strategic choices, which will, these are the choices in that cascade. What's our winning aspiration? Where do we play? How do we win? Capabilities required, managerial systems needed. And you work your way back up, and if it's still your winning aspiration, you go. That's your strategy. Those are your control factors. I also call them dominion factors because they're the things that you have dominion over. Uh, number of trends and signals of industry change. Those are, we refer to those as pestle factors. Political, economic, social, technological, legal, and ecological. Those six categories describe the macro environment in which your organization has to survive. And you don't control any of those things. In fact, nobody, nobody controls um, whether or not Trump gets reelected, really. We can debate that. Uh, nobody really controls that, though. That's an uncontrollable, but it's a scenario factor politically that you're going to have to cope with as a business choice maker, decision maker. The other one, the one that the factors that other industry players control. These are really uh, understanding when you confront a competitor in the marketplace, how do you predict who's going to win? Now, when I tell that to executives, they're usually like, well, you can't tell me who's going to win. And I'll say, well, it seems that way now. But I can prove, can show you who will win based upon the superiority criteria of the market. And if we walk through a little exercise, usually it takes about an hour, um, they now have elevated their humility level because I've usually uh, struck fear into their hearts about the future, that they are now teachable for what the marketplace wants. And those values are hard to shake once you've got them. By the way, all of those values are Jesus approved. Humility, empathy, teachability. If you look at the gospel, that's really what Jesus was teaching us. 
also that we are broken, lost, sinful people and need salvation. That's really a lot of the lesson of the Gospels. It boils down to that being the values that are required uh, in order to create peace, fruits of the Spirit. Uh, there's a whole bunch of examples to this. And Mike, I hope you distribute or tweet out or something the link to this. Feel free uh, to, to, to send this out. Um, and then you, you can walk through these control factors for your business. Um, and you have to do it at the offering level, the business model level, because that offering will bring a range of offers to the market. My job in these exercises is usually to convey the deep indifference of the market to whatever your plan is. My strategy, and to show you where it's going to fail, to show you the weak spots. If I can do that, then you can fix them. You can change the offer such that the offer is now recalibrated in alignment with the superiority criteria that the market will reward with share. You're not over delivering on satisfiers anymore. You're actually programming drop in attracting market share from competitors in whatever market you choose to enter. And you are redefining performance with disruptors that the market didn't know that it needed yet. It's an equation. It's math. And anybody can learn how to do this. Those are examples of how they show up in a business, I want to learn, um, how to get started. Uh, this is sort of how we think about its process in terms of decision making. The superiority analysis should, ha should happen out here ahead of investment choices. Before you invest a single dollar of liquid capital in the business that you're trying to do a superiority analysis on the business. That superiority analysis will de-risk every single capital investment that you'll make um, for the future. And that's the future of my business. The future of Aurora is spreading this gospel of superiority analysis, making the future a less risky place to grow. There are very predictable results that happen out of that. Last uh, fall, not last fall, but the fall of 2018, uh, we did this startup uh, thing called Reconverge Demolition here in Milwaukee. We took three startups through um, a demolition process whereby we recalibrated their offer. Um, there's a documentary film, a 30-minute documentary film called Angles of Attack. If you go to my uh, Twitter profile, you'll see a link on there. I tweeted about it today. You can download the mobile app. It's the Reconverge mobile app. Uh, and when you download the Reconverge mobile app, you can then watch the movie. But you can't watch the movie until you because I don't trust social media. I have to have my own social media platform if I'm going to actually produce predictable results. It's simple. I can't produce predictable results unless I own the platform. Period. It's kind of obvious, actually. So in order to watch the movie, you got to download the app. And if you don't want to watch the movie, that's fine. Three minutes long. It tells the story of these three startups that we took through the demolition process. Those three companies were totally transformed in the space of about 30 days. They went from kind of sketch a little, you know, like they're not going to make it. Like the way you sort of see them present at the beginning of the movie, it's like they got venture funding. Um, and by the end of the movie, they are, in all humility, they are slick. You're cheering for those guys. So the movie's on uh, Reconverge Mobile. If you open your app store of choice, type in the word Reconverge. It'll find the app for you. We'll run a movie night. There you go. That's awesome. I should invite founders for, to come up for it because they're all from the area. I love you how you think, Mike. <laughs> Karaoke. Yes. I like it a lot. Um, one of those founders is a guy uh, named, um, well, I just blanked on his name. Uh, he's the CEO of a company called Area. And um, Ali, his name is Ali. And he, uh, Became CEO of this company about two years prior. They're venture backed. Um, they've got a little bit of investment capital. And when he came into the demolition process, I said, so, so Ali, tell me what you did today. Well, as CEO, I was tracking down a receivable from a, well, it's the uh, Oregon Department of Health and Human Services. Oh, okay. Well, how much do they owe you? $9,000. Really? And you're the CEO and you're tracking down a $9,000 receivable. Well, how long has that been? That's about 16 months we've been waiting for our money. I said, well, of course you know that. You know, that that's a futile effort. They're, they're not going to pay you. And he's like, well, yeah, but I got to keep trying or else I got to answer to my board about why I lost this nine grand. I said, all right, Ali, I think I know what the problem is. 
What TCARES app did, it's a, it's a software application, it's based on research that came out of the School of Social Work at the University of Wisconsin. The dean of the School of Social Work is one of the founders of this company. The algorithm itself predicts when a caregiver is going to institutionalize a loved one. If you have any relatives with Alzheimer's or any sort of other disability, um, the app can, are going to reach a point of so much fatigue in caring for your loved one that you're going to put them in a home. And it does it by asking you questions about how you feel. And it does diagnostics against the, the database of others who are in that data set that you also match. And it can predict with ability at what point you break and put grandma in a home. So much so that uh, in Colorado, I think it was Colorado where they did a study, they determined that they could delay the institutionalization event by 22 months. They can help you as caregiver to you. Delay her institutionalization by 22 months. I'm like, Ali, that's freaking genius. I mean, Jesus approves of that sort of thing. That's really great. Um, he's like, yeah, but we've been selling it to these departments of health and human services. They don't have any money. They're a bunch of bureaucrats. They don't even want to pay us. We're screwed. We don't get paid at all. Thus, the Oregon Department of Health and Human Services is not paying Ali. I said, Ali, we need to reprogram your offer. So we recalibrated the offer. And uh, long story short, and you'll see this in the movie, we changed who his customer was, and we changed, changed the algorithm. The algorithm was still the same. It was still used to do diagnostics around the institutionalization fatigue that the loved one or, is or the caregiver is going to feel for their loved one. It was just not how they paid for it. Now, if you want me to tell you how we changed it, you've got to watch the movie. So we'll get the full story. So this is really, uh, this is from about 20 years ago. This is a slide that I used to have. It's why it's so ugly, um, is because my PowerPoint uh, skills were quite uh, less mature than they are today. But uh, this is a slide that I used to use that describes kind of how strategy gets turned into action, mostly valid. Um, but I like to think of it as uh, a continuous process by which a company evolves that strategy to adapt to market and capital market decisions and choices. Um, this is how a lot of executives in the late 1990s, the time at which I was learning about how business strategy really worked, this is how a lot of those businesses, um, I'm now sort of working this because I think there are four aspects to this model which are sort of encapsulated in the way Aurora's ended up uh, performing over the last 25 years. If you think about um, sort of coming up from the bottom, there is a data set that is revealing itself. We're able to reveal the data set. We can now make more valid choices about it. In order to reveal the data set, however, we need to have a tool set in which to analyze it and a skill set by which we will do that analysis. So if you think about first light, first light reconverge is a skill set business. And GPS is really a data set business. So if you think about tool set, data set, skill set, what's the fourth thing that's missing? It's mindset. It's all about having a mindset which is infinite. Back to the original and that's my final word tonight for you guys is don't play finite games. You are in an infinite game called life. That infinite game goes on after you leave this world. I promise. And you need to be thinking about that. Uh, if you're 20 years old and sitting out there and wondering what this old dude has to say about it, it's as simple as that. Questions? Nobody dares ask a question after that one, right? Thank you, everybody. Appreciate your attention. So everybody can see this again. If you started getting lazy there, this was gold. Okay, believe me, this was gold. I've already had people messaging me during this, so make sure you process all of this. Now, I have a proposition for you. Yeah. Now, I we'll talk about this offline. That I have a client for you. Yeah. But if you Yep. I promise I'll put together a top shelf team and we'll go to karaoke with you. Yes, I'll do it. <laughs> it's a deal. You guys send me five of your best. 
we will have a great time in Madison April 21st through 23rd. I promise. Now, a very interesting connection that he made that uh, I don't know if you were purposely made, but Phillips brings the guy out of the music business. In his first two minutes of his talk, he was talking about how, you know, what does winning mean? It means being able to continue playing the game. And then an hour and a half later, he gave an example of a company that figured they couldn't play the game anymore and surrendered. Yep. Got it. But this was a, a great experience, and we have a couple of our top students, Blaine and Eric, are both working with uh, 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 Eric with an E. Eric Poole is working with Eric with an A, uh, uh, and his company actually is working with uh, Greg as CTO yep. uh, on their senior project. This is a relationship that we continue to build, but uh, this is cool stuff, and this is where the future is going. So uh, he drove an hour and a half each way to come and see us tonight. So give him another applause. Thank you. You bet. So, um, question one: What kind of tech jobs at Aurora at MVP? What sort of tech, tech type jobs are there? Today? Yeah. Great question. So. Here in Milwaukee, I'm building a software engineering team, uh, and we've got a couple of big stretch goals. Stretch goals are called uh, ontology discovery. We need to build a system that discovers the hidden ontologies that exist within any corpus of documents, conversations, a database, essentially. Um, revealing what those ontologies are is not necessarily new, but revealing it in a way that fits into this framework, inventing some new science there, and a lot of that's machine learning. So, uh, data science, machine learning, and AI, how we do that, that work um, is really where I'm tasking Greg to sort of define what those job descriptions are. We just hired a woman from uh, Mercyhurst uh, University in Erie, Pennsylvania, and so a lot of her work with Greg is really reverse engineering the AI and then training the machine to discover aspects of the ontology across a bunch of different market verticals. So that it doesn't matter if you're a biopharmaceutical company or you rent seats on an airplane. I can tell you things about the future path um, and how do I extract that, analyze that, and show where those clusters and patterns lie. So that's number one. What's your second question? I think that was related to it. I think you answered both, but I'll ask it again just for sake of clarity. What skills must a tech related employee possess to get a job working in Aurora WBP? Great question. So humility, empathy, and teachability. Um, and I tell this to everybody when they, when they join Aurora. I'm usually the last interview you'll have at Aurora, and it's not because I'm trying to DQ you, um, disqualify you, I'm trying to, trying to test you. Um, I'm trying to test your, uh, and usually one of the things I'll tell you is, what you know how to do on day one is gonna pale in comparison to what you know how to do on day 101. We are a learning organization. It's all about learning things, and we don't stop. And if you love to learn, and you really love to learn, is, is the real question. We'll test your appetite for that. Ask Blaine and Eric back there how their limits are being tested uh, in terms of how much they like to learn. That's really it, is you've got such potential. All of you guys have this uh, capacity, and so seldom are you actually tested in terms of what that capacity for learning is. Um, working with young people is, what is your capacity for learning? I bet it's a lot more than you thought it was. And let's find out. Let's find out together. So skill sets, um, I think experience in uh, you know, building things, architecture of systems, and understanding, boy, how would I, how would I solve a problem? That's a big engineering team. How are we going to solve this problem? How do we think about it? And then how do we iterate through uh, you know, the process of, of addressing that problem to make continuous progress towards it. And that system's really Greg's. You know, Greg really runs that, uh, runs that team. Uh, I don't, um, thankfully, because when I ran it, it um, Greg runs a team that actually gets things done and gets things done that is globally competitive. So if you'd like, send me an email and I'll put you in touch. Guess who forgot his business cards tonight? Oh, message me, I'll get you in touch with him. So if you guys want to talk about any of that stuff, please get in touch. Uh, if not me, I'll put you in touch with somebody you think you might want to join forces with us. And I um, assume resumes from history majors are immediately shredded? Well, you know what? I actually think history majors have this sort of uh, perspective on the past. Yeah, you would think that. 
It, yeah, it's like, it's like, you know. So when I was when I was in college, my uncle, who's a Presbyterian, he to be a historian. I said, yeah, I want to be a historian. Uh, well, how's that going to work out for you? And I'm like, well, I'll probably end up going into business for myself because there's not a big market for historians out there with undergraduate degrees. And he's like, right, okay, fine. Uh, and he's still alive, and um, he, he and I, you know, after 20 years, I think I understand what you do now. I think I understand sort of what you do, and wow, like, who'd have thunk a history major could have done those things? We have to bring him out for so. karaoke. Yeah, exactly. Yep, he's got a pretty good voice, too. Yeah. So, so do I when you hear this. I love it. Yeah, so good. I love it. What's your go-to? Uh, oh, anything. Yeah. Like uh, and the thing is, I'm not even not. kidding. Several of these folks in here have heard me sing Backstreet Boys. Dude. Yeah, it's a thing. I, man, I wish I was staying overnight tonight. We'd uh, we'd have a good time. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll connect soon, very soon, because we've got to talk about that client. Yeah, right on. Um, okay, so if you want to hang out for a few minutes and ask him some questions, uh, the AP folks can get back and get home. Um, uh, if you're in my class tonight, uh, let's meet in the classroom at, say, 8, 12, so about 20 minutes, you know, stretch, whatever. Um, I don't know what Dr. Lockler's class is doing, so talk to Dr. Lockler. Forecast the uh, likely impacts of artificial intelligence on the regional.